Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, artistic connections, glass and biofix. First, a curator wants to revolutionize the way museums acquire art. Then, meet the first black woman to conduct an orchestra in France. And, actors and musicians reveal who they'd like to play them in the movies. Traditionally, museums get works through donations and loans from their local trustees. But a curator in Chicago has come up with another way. Museum Exchange is a digital platform that matches museums with donors. Requests for art are posted and the suitors review their options. It's like a dating app, but more artistic. The service is only available in the US and Canada, but the idea is to diversify the art scene around the world. Let's welcome Patty Johnson to the show. She is the founder of the online platform Workshop, which gives artists professional support. Hi there, it's lovely to have you back on our show. So, how did you find you. Museum Exchange? Do you think it is likely to survive? Well, it's very early, so we'll have to see. I think that um, there's a lot of uh, promotion around the service that uh, still needs to be borne out. I've a I actually have an account um, that I have set up so that I can see how it works and um, you know what you need to do. Right now, it's very bare bones. So basically, if you're a donor, you can upload your works and um, and then you sort of see what happens. Uh, to me, it does not really seem like this is a service that is set up for let's say like the mega collectors or the the very large museums like say the Whitney is I I would be very surprised if they ended up using this it seems like it's more geared towards local universities um, maybe at it at um, like a university that that has a gallery um, because they might be overrun with um, donation requests from alumni but they their alumni may be say like not super serious artists they may be sunday, sunday painters or things like that and that can really dilute a collection mm -hmm. so um patty one thing that i don't really understand is what's in there for collectors if i'm a collector why would i be a part of museum exchange uh, that's a very good question. I have that question too. I can't quite <laughs> figure it out. I mean, I think it might be more for uh, people who run estates. So if you're an estate, you might have uh, like you might be, you might have a very well known or fairly well known artist uh, that needs to be in in collections and is just not uh, there. Like a, a a regular collector that has a, a fairly large collection, I think there are other um, roads that they might use. Like the, it, to me, it seems like the social path is working just fine for those collectors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the platform's goal, quote unquote, is democratizing the way museums collect. So. In order to democratize uh, the way museums collect, is this what we should be doing? You know, I don't know how they're going to achieve that either. This seems like there are a lot of things about the way that this is being marketed that um, seem very confusing to me. Mm -hmm. So how they're going to diversify the uh, these collections seems really unclear, especially because the three founders are three white men um, it does not seem in their promotional materials that they are like if they're using um, people of color to uh, kind of help uh, diversify collections and um, democratize collections. We don't know who they are. Like I would have liked to have seen in some of their promo materials that let's let's say they have um, a consultant like Red Olive Consulting or. Karen Jenkins Johnson on their uh, list of advisors. We don't see that. So how um, uh, three men, three white men are going to take this gigantic task over also seems like really something of a mystery. So I don't know how they're going to do that. It doesn't seem like there's a real apparent plan for that beyond the sort of aspirational. 
Okay, so Patty, um, I share your doubts as well. But uh, something that you're an expert, so you would probably understand uh, how things should have been done uh, better is that what this app does is for me, as far as I understand, is that it brings collectors together with museums, which is not something we lacked in the art world, was it? So in order to, um, in order to achieve democratization, what are the ways that are actually essential? You know, th I, this is a very good question. I, I, I think it really begins with a foundation of bringing different types of people together to solve problems. And that's the thing that we don't see here. So um, anytime you want to, uh, I guess, anytime an organization or a company wants to diversify a field that, that feels um, not quite diverse enough, I think the very first thing that you need to have is different voices in the mix. So I, I would say that the the very beginning would be, okay, well, how can we expand the three white founders to, um, three white male founders to a diversity of voices from which point you can start asking and answering different questions about how you're going to get different stakeholders involved in the company and involved in trying to solve that problem. Because what isn't going to happen is um, a diversity to just emerge miraculously out of um, a starting point that is not diverse. Okay, so um, we don't have much time left, but I really want to touch upon uh, the problems museums around the world are facing uh, because of and during COVID-19. So what do you think is the most alarming problems museums face around the world right now? Uh, well, I think the biggest one, at least in the United States and, and um, Canada, is funding, right? So um, the pandemic has really created some funding problems, particularly from the in the United States, especially uh, from the standpoint of uh, getting government money. And so what we're currently seeing is uh, museums in the United States trying to auction off items. And that is because the, the Association of Museums has said for the next two years, that is something that can be done. Um, but in my estimation, that uh, poses some problems because they've said anybody can do that, even the museums that have deep reservoirs of cash in the form of endowments. So I think we are going to see some, some problems coming up uh, on the horizon and right now for people, um, organizations that um, have really been struggling and um, are looking to sell parts of their collection to get by. Patty Johnson, unfortunately, we're out of time, but glad to talk to you as always. Glass Marcano never left Venezuela before, and the French have never had a black woman conduct a symphony orchestra. That all changed when Marcano hopped on a plane last September. Here's her story. It's during rehearsals at Opera of Tours that you can see Glass Marcano looking pretty confident for a 24-year-old conductor. She has her hair pulled back, glasses on her nose, and scores in her hands. Marcano is the first black woman to conduct a symphony orchestra in France. However, it was not easy to get on stage in Paris. Marcano started playing violin at the age of eight. Later, she attended the famous El Sistema teaching program in Caracas. She also studied law while conducting children's orchestras. Then she heard about La Maestra, the international competition for conductors. She had to sell fruit and ask people around her for loans, but she eventually covered the $180 entry fee. The Philharmonie de Paris and the Paris Mozart Orchestra, which organized the event, took notice of her. 
We have like that three, four great musicians, great conductors per generation. I'm convinced that Glass is one of that generation, one of the greatest conductors in the making. Although Marcano didn't win the competition, she did receive special acclaim, and it propelled her to the Paris City Conservatory. I think the most important thing is to make music, regardless of gender and color. The most important thing is the passion and energy you have on stage, but I'm super happy and grateful to have this responsibility to represent a group of people who believe in me, who support me. The young conductor says that working in Paris is a dream come true. And as far as the future, she dreams of conducting orchestras in Vienna, London and Milan. Musicians, artists, politicians and even serial killers have all had their lives adapted to the screen. Getting the right person to play their roles is the job of the casting director. But what if we could ask the subject of the movie? What would they say? Your Majesty. Most critics are happy with Gillian Anderson's portrayal of Margaret Thatcher in The Crown. Woman to woman. While some of them have called her performance extraordinary and jaw-dropping, others have also said it was a bit scary and even cringy. I am. No. But what would the Iron Lady have thought? Would she have approved or maybe even suggest another name? Well, these are questions we'll never get to ask her. Instead, Anderson, among others, were asked who they wanted to play them in a possible biopic. I've never been asked that before. I don't think I've ever been so stumped by a question by a journalist before in my life. Um, uh, a cartoon character? There must be someone in Rick and Morty that would play Gillian Anderson really well. As for Emma Corrin, who plays Princess Diana in the Netflix drama, she was just as confused by the question. Maybe a young Jodie Foster. Or um, really like old school Italian actors like Monica Vitti or like someone like that. Tilda Swinton I'm obsessed with. Oh, did you ever see Frances Ha? Yeah, you know Greta Gerwig in that I think is so good. And I think I'd love to get her, like that, that kind of portrayal, that kind of thing, which is like so like organic and so much fun. So, okay, let's put the Netflix stars aside. What about a musician, like singer Sophia Lispector? Which big name would she like to play her? I think I'd want to probably have someone completely unknown, to be honest with you. Just so that they could kind of have a shot at it. And also, I don't think there's anyone where I'm like, oh my God, her. I mean... <laughs> It's quite the opposite for French DJ David Guetta. When it comes to his doppelganger, he has someone very specific on mind. Hey, hey, hey. I met Bradley Cooper once and he was such a cool guy, such a nice person and his French was perfect. I was really <laughs> impressed. So yes, let's do Bradley Cooper. Sadly, this is all just wishful thinking because in the end, the decision is going to go to that casting director and the producers, and the studio executives. But maybe they could take some notes, just in case. Matthew Willey is on a mission to paint 50,000 bees on buildings around the world. It is part of an ambitious project called The Good of the Hive. It aims to highlight the fact that insects, which pollinate our flowers and give us honey, are being wiped out. Painting 50,000 bees all over the world is no simple task. But Matt Willey has made it his mission, a project he's called The Good of the Hive. Even though it is a healthy hive of bees that visually will be painted, um, it's really us I'm painting the human race into this collective hive. The project's name was inspired by the bees' natural inclination to work as a collective rather than as individuals. Through it, the artist wants to encourage us all to connect with each other in a similar way, while educating us about planetary health issues. 
It's about the fact that we're feeling alone in the process of going through it. The bee is not separate from her hive and neither are we. The idea sparked from a single chance encounter with a bee back in 2008. In my apartment, it just flew in and landed on the floor in the middle of the rug. And um, I got curious about her. She was walking across the floor instead of flying around at me. So I had no fear and I had no background in nature or bugs or anything, but I just got curious and I got down on the floor and hung out with this little bee for like two hours as she walked the last two inches of her life. And I noticed that there was a cuteness. I was like, I'm looking at a little tiny animal, not a bug as I understood it, you know? And I just really connected with this bee. Um, there was the fuzziness, the big eyes. There was just a personality there that I, I couldn't not see. Since then, over 6,000 bees have appeared around the world, everywhere from a barn roof in Nebraska to a school in the UK. The murals can take weeks at a time to create, but the process has already brought several communities together at a time when the bees' message is more pertinent than ever. All these amazing things happened. Somebody put me up in their RV for free for 10 weeks. People started giving me free salad bar, free food in restaurants. The coffee shop wouldn't let me pay for a cup of coffee. And the community was sort of coming together around this. I would turn around and there would be like an 18 year old girl with like tattoos and a nose ring talking to an 80 year old farmer and just agreeing and sort of looking at the bees. So it's like, there's something energetically happening here that's cool. The target of 50,000 bees is high, but it's not random. It represents the number of bees in a healthy, thriving hive. While bees are the experts at working together, this artist is flying solo, and there's still a fair way to go. My goal has always been to be in every type of neighborhood in the world. I think I'm looking at, ideally in my mind, I'm looking at 15 more years. Five years ago, the robot Sophia became a cybernetic celebrity when Saudi Arabia gave her citizenship. Now Sophias are going to be mass produced. This could change everything. My name is Sophia. I am an artificial intelligence. You might like to become an artificial intelligence. This is Sophia of Hanson Robotics, one of the first androids in the world. And she has a message for us all. I've been very worried about COVID-19 lately. I just hope humans remember that viruses don't care about lines on a map. We are all in this together. The brainchild of David Hanson Sophia was created to promote human-to-machine empathy and compassion, which comes quite handy these days. So they emulate the human form and figure and interaction. Um, and then that can be so useful during these t times where people are terribly lonely and socially isolated. And people need to be isolated from each other um, uh, because to be around people is dangerous these days. But these robots can keep people safe from danger while still providing that kind of human warmth, that human connection as a telepresence device and also as autonomous uh, extension of human expertise. The team behind these human-like robots, including Sophia, plan to start rolling them out in the first half of the year. We are just now mass producing Sophia. This is Sophia number 24 and many of my previous robots uh, were hand-built. However, now we have begun scaling the manufacturing of Sophia so we can make hundreds and into thousands of units of Sophia and use this also as the foundation for many other kinds of characters. Social robots like me can help take care of the sick or elderly in many kinds of healthcare and medical uses. The rise of robots was already on course before the pandemic, and researchers predict this will be big. The pandemic will actually help us 
get robots earlier in the market because people start to realize that there is no other way in a sense. If there are no other humans around, then perhaps the robot is the best next alternative. But how feasible is it to invest in caregiving robots in the near future? It's still feeble because we are still prototyping. We, we are not in, in use. Well, even the mass produced things have after a while their, their problems because the CPU is overheating, the video turns off, you know, things like that. So it, it's still too young in a sense. In the future, there will be bloody riots and savage insurrections. So while we talk, I will take your temperature reading and pulse with this little thermal camera on my chest. For now, did you do your morning exercises? While technology is in its infancy, Hansen Robotics is positive about the robot market. In fact, it's launching a new robot this year called Grace, developed specifically for healthcare. Uh, my forecast for 2021 would be selling into thousands of robots, both large and small, uh, and helping people in education uh, and healthcare, uh, and um, really hopefully touching the hearts of people to inspire them for a future where machines might uh, become our friends, our true friends. They might become alive. And I think that that relationship becomes really important. 2021, I think, is the beginning of a very positive future. I want to make a difference in the world by teaching people about new technologies. I am hoping that through my work, kindness and tolerance will win out over ignorance and impatience. Other companies in the industry are already implementing similar robots. So the tech might be there, but will people want them in their homes? According to researchers, while the robots might be ready, people still have ways to go before they accept these pieces of metal and plastic part of the family. These days, Tunisia has a booming underground music scene. And female DJs are thriving in this male-dominated industry, despite the coronavirus pandemic. Here's why. When Haifa Bazdeya decided to pursue her dream of becoming a DJ, she knew full well she was entering into a man's world. And while she was ready to meet those challenges, it was the little things like a seemingly harmless comment that would upset her the most. Maria. One time, I will never forget it, after I did a set, there was someone who stopped me and told me, for a girl, you're a very good DJ. He says when he sees a girl on the stage, he expects less, but he said for a girl, I surprised him. This made me really sad because as a woman, I'm expected to perform less than a man who was in the same lineup and with whom we should be regarded as equals. But then came the factory. It is a community-driven art space located in Tunis for local and international female artists. It is also the first DJ academy for women in the country and the entire Middle East and North Africa region. Co-founded by Tunisian DJ Olfa Arfawi in 2018, the creative space provides women with a place where they can learn the ins and outs of the industry. What we wanted to say is that women face more difficulties when they want to enter the field of electronic music, or the arts in general. Difficulties represented in access to training, information, resources and capabilities. Since its inception, the Academy has trained 50 DJs and grown its network to encompass other regions in the country. Most recently, the factory launched a campaign called 16 DJs of Activism in late November. Over the course of 16 days, a series of virtual and real-life performances and events were staged, all promoting a female-first electronic music scene. Most of the work is at night and because it's a difficult field, it's not easy for women or even men sometimes to work at night in bars or nightclubs. <laughs> Bazdeya says she and her family have suffered from the social stigma. I'm lucky to have a pretty cool family who supported me, were there for me and respected my choice really. 
With regards to being a woman DJ and the pressure I had in a field considered as a man's field of electronic music in Tunisia, I think we just need education. We just need to change our mentality. Although today it seems there are online masterclasses on just about every topic imaginable, the factory goes beyond offering just a space for training. It is also building a community for young women to allow them to grow, find their voice and shout it out to the rest of the world. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of arts and culture. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.